Good morning. Let's try it again. Good morning. Good morning. I must admit that uh, I'm blessed that I'm able to travel around the country, and uh, I do consider it uh, a blessing most of the time. Uh, travel is getting to be very, very difficult right now with all of the um, security that, uh, that's going on in all the airports, but I, I consider it a blessing. But as one who travels a lot, there are certain cities that you really enjoy visiting. And it may have something sometimes to do with um, the evening, the nightlife, and some other kinds of things that you have. But for me, uh, it's about the people where I am going that I get a chance to meet and get a chance to share. And one of my favorite places to visit, quite honestly, is Waco. And, and to be honest with you, I have not had the opportunity to partake in any of the nightlife uh, of, uh, of Waco. In fact, last night I was exhausted. Uh, I, I, um, you were very kind in having me to stand, but I don't even know what you said. Because um, I'd worked all day yesterday and then, uh, in uh, Shreveport and then jumped in the car and drove from Shreveport here. And uh, I just thought Shreveport was like right down the street. And um, I kept driving and driving. And I looked at the GPS and it said, only 200 miles to go. And I, 200 miles to go. But the bottom line is that every time I come here, that uh, people here are so nice. And I thank you, um, uh, Dr. Shields and uh, Mrs. Dupree. I thank you very much for the opportunity to come into all of those dignitaries who are staying here this, this morning. I, um, I enjoy your city. And there are a lot of things happening in your city. Um, just in the short time that we have been a part of the uh, La Vega educational process that I have noticed. The last time that um, I was invited here, um, the, we were, I think, crossed the, crossed the hall. And the uh, jackhammers and the hammers uh, helped me give my presentation. And it was. Um, I, w I think I annoyed them uh, because I dare tried to speak over their jackhammer. But the bottom line is you have now such a beautiful um, uh, convention center. And uh, as I drove in this time, coming in downtown, I saw the new uh, football stadium, which obviously is going to be a major, major draw for this uh, community. So I see great things happening in this community. And uh, that really comes without me knowing, you know, the new mayor, if you will, uh, but that comes from great leadership. It comes from a community deciding that it's going to work together to improve the quality of life for the people who live there. But one of the things that I picked up on last night <coughs> was quite honestly a question that was uh, asked by uh, Ambassador Olson. And I like to come to, uh, um, if I'm going to be a keynote among three or four, and, and Mr. Robinson is going to uh, keynote this, this luncheon today, I like to come and hear the other speakers because I like to tie in what I'm going to say with what they said. The worst thing that I think you can have is two or three or four speakers, and they are all going in different directions. I like to make sure that it's connected because I believe that you ought to leave out of here with an understanding, a clear message of the connectivity of the, uh, of the event. And so when I, when I sat there last night and I was listening to the speaker last night, George hit a couple of points and then later on, Ambassador Olson came up to the stand and said, you know what, I wanted to ask you about this particular slide that you have. Now I'm one who loves technology, I'm one who loves research and data, and I like to overlay them so that I can understand them better. But if you would look at the slide, that, for those who were not here last night, this was a slide that, um, that Ambassador Olson referenced, he, he actually referenced too, but, but this one is the one that um, I want to zero in on. He asked uh, if, in fact, we have 67,000 jobs, roughly, uh, in, this, in the area, 
Uh, and then we have um, 22,000 or so of those people who have the jobs living in the community. And that means two thirds of the people uh, who have the jobs are living outside of the area. What does that mean in terms of uh, its demography? I mean, how does that break out? Is that an issue around race? Is that an issue around class? Is that an just how do you um, take a look at that? Now, George is truly a numbers guy. When he stood up and he said, well, I don't know quite how to answer that. And that's because he needed the empirical data to, in, order, in order to answer that. That's what he does. That's what Upjohn does for uh, a living. But I took the opportunity to look at those numbers. And then I looked at one of the other slides that George shared with us. And it, it was clear to me when you lay one on top of the other what the issue is as it relates to development. The second slide said that um, the transportation was an issue for African American and Hispanic neighborhoods. And that it showed that there were, um, in some homes or some areas, as much as 20% of the people without, uh, without cars. Well, it stands to reason. So you, you got the data and you got uh, reason. It stands to reason then that the people who are living within the area are people who by and large are um, having to get to work because they don't have transportation so they need to be closer to the transportation. You, you follow where I'm going? So what we find in the city now is that those persons who are closest to those jobs are in some cases people without uh, transportation which turns out to be the African American Hispanic neighborhoods and therefore, those persons are those persons who are uh, closer to the jobs. Mm -hmm. And the other people are moving uh, outside of that realm. And we find that they are um, significant in number, but not only significant in number, but significant in dollar. And that's where I want to, cut, to tie in our conversation today. Because any, I, I am a former assistant um, uh, Vice President at the Chamber of Commerce, so I understand the connectivity between uh, employment and, and education. I understand the, the connectivity between employment and, uh, and um, uh, the accessibility of, of, um, of the jobs. So I understand those kinds of concepts, but one of the things that is real clear to me is that we have to recognize that if we are going to, in Waco, and I'm saying we because I, I enjoy uh, being a part of this fabric, and, and by the way, Dr. Shields, um, I, I, we certainly appreciate, our company appreciates you hiring us. The universities where my daughters go appreciate you hiring us. Um, <laughs> baby Kareem appreciates you hiring us. So and if, is there anybody else out there who wants to hire us? We appreciate you too. But the, the significance of that is we've got to look at what's happening. What's the change? And prepare ourselves for the change. Because if we don't prepare ourselves for the change, then we won't be ready for the change. The, the, the part of that that I found to be most significant was not raised by you, Ambassador, but, but rather by your six foot nine brother. And so <laughs> when he stood up, he, uh, Charlie said something that I found uh, very interesting. You know, he said that the state of Texas is in the middle of a major, major growth. How many people were here last night? I just want to make sure that, okay. The state of Texas is in a major, major growth. And he, he, he kind of drew a line, I believe the highway was 35. And he said that, that uh, one of the cities that's going, and he said that the population was practically going to double and, and et cetera. But he said, one of the things that you've got to recognize is that um, the city, one of the cities that going to profit or benefit from this explosion in, in population growth is Waco. So the question that I have to raise is whether or not Waco is getting ready for the explosion. And if you look at the, the demographics, what I see on the horizon is that the, the Hispanic population, the African American population is significantly growing so I've got to ask the question, are we preparing ourselves for what's coming next? Is this making sense to anybody? And so as we, as educators, as we, as community people, as we, as uh, just interested uh, citizens gather here at this particular summit, 
I need you to reflect on what is the best way to prepare ourselves for this change. Let me now kind of get into the slide. That was something that I just kind of picked up from, from them from last night. And I want to try to tie this all in together because the issue for me right now is change. The change is going to be dramatic and the change is going to be substantive. And I need to make sure that in the little few minutes that I have this morning that I began to share with you this whole concept of change. And what I would like for you, I'm going to, I am a walker, so I, I need to be able to, to, um, to walk and talk with everybody. I need to make sure that we make every effort to bring about the change. What I saw everybody uh, look at last night was the, 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 um, the, the, the data. And the data was very clear that you are getting ready to experience the change. So the question is now, once you see the change, then you must seek to understand the change. And then I believe you must grasp the change. Well, here is something that I think to be very important, and that is this. There are basically four reasons why people change or buy into change. And for the, to my educators who are here, I, the teacher in me is coming out now. I have to walk around to see who's participating, who's paying attention, who's not. That's the teacher in me is just coming out right now. And if you don't have a pen or pencil, get one in your hand. I, I need you to <laughs> pretend as if you were paying attention. If you're not, then I'm going to get a little ruler and pop you. But the reality of it is there are four reasons why people, and, and the judge, that, that's you too, and, 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 and no, you don't have to do anything you don't want to do. It's okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I may have to see you. I, I was speeding yesterday, so I don't know. But, but the reality of it is four reasons why people change and people buy into change. And I need you to understand that because it's going to help you understand yourself and it's going to help you understand your organization, whether that's educational organization, private corporation, uh, nonprofit, whatever it may be. So let's, let's kind of, I, I want you to write them down because I want you to, to kind of um, do a self-assessment of self as well as your organization. So let's kind of write this down if you would. The first reason why people change and, the, and how that change is sustained is because of desire. People change because of desire. They have a desire to change. The second reason why people change and change is sustained is because of incentives. People are somehow incented to make this change. The third reason why people change and change is sustained is because of pressure slash heat. And the fourth reason that people change is because of environment. Now, here's, here's a little quick exam. Here's an exam to see if you're paying attention. I need you to put a little check mark by the one that you believe will create and sustain change the longest in your, uh, in your, in your um, organization, whether that's educational or nonprofit, whatever, in your organization. Which one do you believe will create and sustain change the longest? All right? All right. Just a little check mark. And just, this doesn't, shouldn't take very long. All right. Now, how many of you said, um, and there's no right or wrong answer, but I want to kind of talk this out. How many of you said desire? Raise your hand. You're absolutely correct. The desire is absolutely correct. How many of you said incentives? You're absolutely correct. I told you, they're all right, so I'm going to, I'm going to say that every time. How many of you said pressure slash heat? That one person, you're correct. You must work for Dr. Shields. Uh, num num <laughs> Number, how, how many people said environment? Raise your hand. Well, you're absolutely correct. All right. Now, you're all correct, but I want to kind of walk you through these four to see if you can see something based on what I believe to be very important. The first thing that I want to share with you is this notion of desire. And everybody who raised their hand on desire, you are absolutely correct. Desire does bring about change, and it does sustain change. However, 
The downside of desire is that it is driven by, motivated by feelings and emotion. And feelings and emotion change. And sometimes they change rapidly. In other words, in the, in the educational environment, you know, I, I can talk about that one uh, easily. Uh, in the educational environment, uh, uh, my staff love me as long as I allowed them to do what they wanted to do. But the moment I challenged them, the moment I pushed back on something that they do, all of a sudden these same people who were uh, saying great things about me, Ambassador, who, who talked, oh, oh, Mr. Cambon is just the best principal we ever had. I just love him. Oh, just God bless him. He's just wonderful. These are the people who love me. And then I said, you know what? You cannot come in late again. This is the third time that you've been late this week, and today is Wednesday. <laughs> I expect you on the fourth day to be on time. That same person who said all the glowing things about me just a half an hour ago, now, you know, I can't stand him. He makes me sick. He, no, you know what? He's always picking on me. He's always singling me out. You know why he's singling me out? Because I, I don't brown nose. I don't take a high. I just do what I need to do. And all of a sudden, now, this is the same person who just finished saying they were really excited about me and my leadership. But they were excited because I, I was allowing them to do certain kinds of things. I wasn't bothering them. But the moment I, I, I put some boundaries on it, all of a sudden now, they're not as excited about me. So I say, you know what? If I had gone into a classroom and said, you know, there's some things that we want to change today. And I know that you're excited about being here because you, you told me that earlier this morning. So I'm, I'm excited about these changes we're going to make right now. <laughs> you may have not experienced people looking at you as if you've lost your mind, but they look at you like, now, I know you're not talking to me about changing nothing. <laughs> because I'm not going to change it. All of a sudden now, the attitude changed. If you want to look at it differently, you can say, you know, when you see people that you don't understand and you don't know why they behave or what they do and why they do it, then I'm not as excited about being around those people. So my desire is impacted on my feelings about that people. So from a business perspective, sometimes you want to make the change, but you're not sure you want to make the change or will, uh, you, because your desire has lessened based on who you have to work with. So desire does work, but it is too closely aligned with feelings and emotion, and thereby will not be sustained very long. The second one, is incentives, and everybody, a um, large number of people raise their hand on incentives, and you're absolutely correct. Incentives work. But the problem with incentives is that it is motivated by, driven by resources, and resources are not unlimited. In this particular society right now, we are dealing with trying to do more with less. And I'm excited about, you know, the opportunity to come here and be, and I, I understand uh, the whole notion around uh, incentive. There, I, when, when I got the call from Mrs. Dupree about coming down, I said, oh, shh, love to, love to come back down here. Oh, I love the people, et cetera. And I do love all of you. But listen, at the end of the day, I expect to see somebody come in with a little something in their hand. <laughs> you, do you understand what I'm saying? Now, it, that, that's an inside joke because they've already paid me now. I doubt, now. But, the, but the bottom line is you want to see somebody. We lo I love what I do. I, would, I, I, would, I love it so much that I would do it for free. Just not today. <laughs> How many of you love what you do? How many of you would do it for five years for free? Okay, then. So <laughs> everybody like that. They're looking around like, who raised their hand? What idiot raised their hand? The truth of the matter is, I know, I know, I know. I, I'll leave that alone. But the reality of it is, 
the reality of it is, yes, we, we do love what we do and we do give all that we have, but there is some kind of incentive that makes it even better to do it. Now, when we are dealing with it in terms of the educational arena, we often say to our, our staff, uh, <laughs> we're going to have uh, a workshop on Saturday. And we want everybody to come because Mr. Cambon and his team is coming into town. And you know how good they are. You know, they're going to have a lot of fun. And we laugh all the time. And, uh, and let's just have a good time. So come on over. Now, all the teachers show up. And then Dr. Shields had to stand before, you know, um, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you so much for coming this, this Saturday morning. We're going to have a wonderful time. We are here, and uh, I, I expect us to do uh, some great things after we hear from these people today. By the way, uh, I had a chance to talk to Ms. Peggy uh, Johnson about, uh, about uh, the money, and we thought we were going to be able to pay you today for the time that you're here, but it appears that the money now is gone. We don't know where it went, but that's okay. You are here now, and we're going to have a wonderful time this morning. <laughs> now, let me help you. In about 15 to 20 minutes after I start my presentation, I will be the only one in the room. <laughs> and and, 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 and what we typically do at, let's say, Tried Stone Baptist Church, there's a little finger move that you put. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You put that little finger up in the air, and you ease up out here, and you tell the people, I'll be right back. You know, I, I, I'm going to the restroom. I'll be back. You know you're not going to the restroom. You're going home. And it isn't because you don't think great information is going to be shared, that you're not going to enjoy yourself, but hey, this is my Saturday, and I'm giving it up, and I expect there to be some kind of incentive for giving it up. You, you follow where I'm going? So incentives work, but the problem is it works only as long as the resources exist, and resources are limited, which then takes us then to the third one, which is pressure and heat. Pressure and heat work. Oh, yes, it does. Yes, it does. People don't like to admit pressure and heat works, but it does. If you're the mayor of the city and you walk in to a particular department, do you know that people move around <laughs> even if they haven't moved all day? <laughs> you just walk in. Good morning. Everybody says, ooh, the mayor's here. All right, move around. Let's move chairs around. Let's move. <laughs> Why are you moving the chairs? I don't know, but that's the mayor right there. Let's move around. <laughs> if you're the principal, if I have any principals in here, I, you know, uh, uh, pr 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 I say this to my principals all the time. You know, there are some principals who say, fee, five, four, thumb, I'm the principal, and you better run. <laughs> well, that works until you get called out of the building, and principals get called out of the building all the time. And you know what happens when you get caught out of building principles? The secretary gets on the PA system <laughs> and does an all call. She's gone. <laughs> and everybody says, oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> they start having a party. And they put two or three little children outside to see your car coming. And they <laughs> So when they see you come back, here she comes, here she comes. And then she goes back, here she comes. And everybody come back. And it looks as if everything has gone on just normal. They had a ball while you were gone. <laughs> but pressure and heat works. I remember very vividly, I was new to my job and I was walking down the hall as, as they, have, they taught us to do in, in Principle 101. I was walking down the hall and I learned to, you know, to speak to my staff and I learned to speak to the students. And I walked down. And the one thing that my staff knew is that I had a pet peeve about teachers sitting at the desk all day. You, you don't do that, not, not around me. You just don't do that because instruction takes place. You, 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 you need to move around, you, you, you know what I'm saying? So they know that that's something that I can't stand. So I walked in the room and I stuck my head in the door and I said, Good morning, students. They said, good morning, Mr. Cambon. I looked over and she was sitting at her desk. I said, good morning, Ms. Johnson. And so she was sitting at her desk and she was sitting down like this. 
And so she said, hey, good morning, Mr. Campbell. She started rocking. <laughs> How are you this morning? I, uh, we so, we're so happy that you're here. And I looked at her, no, you're not. I didn't say anything. But she, she was just rocking. And she didn't know that I knew why she was rocking. The reason she was rocking is that she didn't have on any shoes. And she was trying to find her shoes. <laughs> and the shoes were up under the, be up under, up under the, 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 uh, the desk. And finally, just like an old shoe, it would turn the wrong way. So she had to get all the way up under the desk to get the shoe. And here's what happened. She got the shoes on, both shoes on, and she got up. I never had to say a word. I'm just standing at the door. She got up from the desk, and she walked away from, from the desk. And she said, class, as I told you on yesterday, because you are all lifelong learners, I'm excited about what you're going to learn today and excited about what you're going to learn for the rest of the week. But the faces of my children told me everything I needed to know. Because my children looked at <laughs> And there's always one in the, in the back, Willie. You didn't, you didn't tell us that yesterday. <laughs> That's not what you said. You told us, you told us. Did she, did she, did she say that last night? Everybody's like, I, I'm not saying anything, Willie. You're on your own right now. And they said, you told us to put our head down because we make you sick. Now, that's what you said. <laughs> now, mind you, I'm standing in the door. I have not said one word. But it's the pressure of my presence. You get it? My, the pressure. But I've now gotten all the information I wanted. I just walk away, close the door. And what's interesting about that is, sometimes as you walk away, the devil gets in you. And uh, I'm walking down the hall. I said, well, let me run back and see what happens. <laughs> so I, I ran back and I said, here. And I heard her say, Willie, I ain't lying. If I lose my job behind that stupid statement you just made, I'm going to keep you in the fourth grade forever. And so what I learned from that is that pressure and heat does cause change. But the problem with it, the change is sustained only by the pressure. And so when the pressure is removed, things go back to the way that they were. Is this making sense? So pressure and heat does work. But then the bottom line is only as long as it is applied. Which then takes us to the fourth one. And the fourth one that I share with you is environment. And that really truly is the one that will sustain change the longest. It is the one, because what environment says is that it really doesn't matter to us where you come from. These are our standards. These are our expectations. It really doesn't matter about whether you come from two-parent household, one-parent household. These are our expectations. This is what we want you to do. It doesn't really matter where you, how you got to work. Once you are here, this is what we expect of you. If you walked, if you rode the bus, if you were dropped off, if you drove your Mercedes, however you got here, this is what we expect you to do. So the environment establishes and maintains your expectations. So as you go back to your respective communities and to your organizations, ask yourself, what does your environment promote? Does your environment embrace the change that Waco is getting ready to experience? Is your school system preparing for the change? Is your business preparing for the change? Is your social organization preparing for the change? If you conclude that it is not preparing for the change, then you wasted Charlie's time last night. We all stood up and applauded when he said, great things are happening in the state of Texas, and Waco is a part of that. But if we don't go back and change and prepare ourselves for the change, then that was just an applaud that was uh, you know, just kind of form. We were doing it because we were here. I think that George and, 
and that Charlie gave us a prescription, if you will, that says, if you want to prepare for the future, these are the, 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 the details. This is the data that you need to use to prepare yourself for. I say very clearly for those who are part of the, the um, faith-based organizations. Are there any here? Because I was told, all right. Let me make this perfectly clear. There is a role in education for faith-based organizations. Now, I, I'm, I'm not concerned as for today whether or not you start your own schools or whether or not you are supportive, but there are some basic principles that I need you to understand. One of the key components of success of a few years ago and the lack of it now is that there has been a shift in the country in values. So I ask you this question. What is the driving force, the motivating force behind behavior? It's values. And so I need faith-based organizations to step up and help clearly establish what the values might be. Because as a society, as a nation, as a community, we're struggling now with what's right, what's wrong, what works, what doesn't work. And I don't need you to, to be so rigid that you intentionally exclude other people because they happen not to think like you, but to ask for spiritual guidance for those who are into that, and ask for spiritual guidance that you might be more inclusive, but at the same time directive. So what does that mean? It means for those who are uh, believers or who are active in uh, some faith-based organization as I am, one of the things that I need you to know is that you really need to spend considerable more time involved in the schools. So I need you to do two things if you do nothing else. One, I need you, those who are in, in, in part of faith-based organization, I need you to have a tutorial program at your institution. A tutorial program. For those who are part of mega churches or mega facilities, then maybe you can help tutor thousands or at least hundreds. But those who are uh, from storefront organizations, at least you can tutor one. I need you to ensure that there are men who are going to the schools. I need you to make sure because, and you say, why, why men and not, not men and women? Because as an educator, I know that, that children respond differently when they see men in the school. Our most effective program was called Men in the Hallway. And all I wanted was men that we did a background check on. <laughs> I just wanted them to walk the halls and speak to my young boys and tell them, you look good this morning. I don't need them to try to teach. That's not what they do. I need them to just look like success and say, young man, you're gonna do well. I can see it in your eyes today. You're gonna do well. I'm happy that you're here today. I'm happy that you, just walking the halls. When they went into the classroom, they didn't do great things in terms of instruction and strategies and, 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 and differentiated instruction. All they did was pass out the papers. But my boys had a chance to see men who valued education. Is this making sense to anybody? So I need you, those of the faith-based organizations, to understand that you have a vital role in helping to establish some strategies whether or not you do any uh, creation of schools on your own, I need you to play a role. To the businesses that are in this community, everybody knows that when an adult or the parents are engaged in the lives of their children, you have a better child. So for those 
who work for you or work in your organization, what might you do every other month to help them become more engaged in their child's life? I don't want you to lose money, but can you develop a program that gives an additional 30, 45 minutes, maybe an hour, I don't know the geographics here, that allows them, in addition to them using their lunch hour every other month, to go over to the school where their child is enrolled and just check on their child? See, I am a student of data, and I know that the, 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 the fact is that most people don't put in a full eight hours anyway, because I know businesses love to talk about, well, you know, that, that, that loses uh, productivity. No, it doesn't. You, 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 you just think that it does. People not working eight hours. How many people feel that like they work the whole time that they're there? Raise your hand. We got one, one liar and one almost. <laughs> you know we don't work. I mean, you know what that says to me? If, to both of you who almost raised your hand and who did raise your hand, that means you never get a phone call unless it is somehow related to your job. And that's not true unless you live on a rock. I mean, bottom line is you, somebody, if you have children, they're going to call you for nothing. <laughs> Am I right? They're like, Dad, I'm broke. I'm sorry, that's your problem, not mine. Well, no, Dad, I'm real broke. So I need you business people to take the lead in ensuring that your employees play an active role in the lives of their children. Because you already know, the data says it clearly, that you really are preparing that next generation to, come in, to, to be a part of your company so wouldn't you want a child who's been properly engaged by their parent, that the parent has gone up to the school and checked on their grades or checked on their performance or checked on their behavior? So it suggests to me that the business community has something to gain by allowing its employees to play a more active role every other month in the lives of their children. And then finally, to my educators, it goes without saying that you need to take into account the whole issue of environment. That you need to make sure that you are preparing for this next generation. It is the motto of our company that what we are trying to do is change something. What we have in, in the entire nation is 20th century instructors teaching 21st century learners. What that suggests to me is that those of us who are in the field of education must make a shift in the way we teach, the way we deliver, even the strategies of the content. Because if we don't, we will continue to use the strategies that were successful in the 20th century and try to impose them on the 21st century learner. And it does not work. I know that many of you, and this is the cra crazy thing about it, uh, spend so much time, uh, if, there, if there are school board members here, or even principals here, um, trying to develop policies that will remove this particular item from the lives of children. Let me help you. Stop wasting your time. <laughs> Trying to remove this from the lives of children is like prohibition. <laughs> it, and you know what happened with prohibition. <laughs> Am I right, Ken? It didn't work, and it's not gonna work with this. This is too bad, but it's not just our children. Watch this, how many of you have a mobile device. Raise your hand high, raise your hand high. Okay, now, put your hands down. All right, put your hands down. How many of you have your mobile device on right now? Raise your hand. Just about all of you. Everybody who raised their hand that had one, it's on now. And you are in a professional meeting, y'all with me? 
having a conversation about things that are professional. And if you won't turn yours off, what makes you think children are going to turn theirs off? Well, they should. Why? They're in my class. OK, so you're in my class, so turn yours off. If you've ever been on the plane, some people will, when, they, when the, when the uh, flight attendant says, please turn your phones off, some people just go into panic mode. No! I can't turn it off! And people literally, and I'm sure you've seen this, no, you, you fly first class, but, but the, <laughs> those of us who are sitting back in the back, Ambassador, you probably have your own jet though, don't you? But the, those of us who are sitting in the back, I have actually seen people hide their phone underneath their thigh. Am I right? You, 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 they hide, and you say, why are you hiding the phone? We're about to be 35,000 feet in the air. Who are you going to call anyway? Nobody's going to call you. All you're going to do is play Angry Bird. And they're going to let you do that once we hit 10,000 uh, uh, feet. So come on. But it's something about turning this thing off that just now trips people out. So children are not are not going to give it up, they're not going to turn it off, but what we can do is control it. Just as the government sought to control liquor through taxes, we're not going to tax this, but, but at least we know how to control it and make it an integral part of instruction. Do you know that this is an effective tool for classroom management? Classroom management. I see that this gentleman over here in the back, who I know is Michael, not paying attention. In fact, he's over there talking right now. I've got my, my, my phone. I'm watching you. <laughs> His phone rings. He looks, because he's going to look. Who, who, who wrote this? Who wrote this? Who's watching me? Who's... I'm watching you. Oh, 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 okay, my bad, my bad, my bad. Now, the reality of it is, this is an effective class. I didn't have to stop teaching. Y'all with me? I didn't have to stop and deal with a confrontation. I just used this tool as an effective tool for classroom management. This is something that we as educators must begin to adjust and stop trying to fight it by, by denying the use of it in the building. It's not going to go away. And we spend way too much time trying to monitor the behavior. Now, I tell you what, if you want to increase parental involvement, take the, take the children's phone <laughs> and say your parents have to come up here and get your phone. You will increase parental involvement and you will also increase uh, emergency squad activity to your school. <laughs> but some of y'all are going to get whipped. So what am I trying to get you to see? As educators, we've got to make a shift. There are five things that I want you to know as an educator before you leave here today that I think will make a difference in your ability to teach and connect with today's students. The first thing is real simple. The first one is this. You need to understand that students now have a shortened attention span. That impacts everything that you do in the classroom. So those who are uh, part of organizations, whether education, uh, uh, direct education, or support of education, we've got to change the way we teach to ensure that we reach this new generation that's coming in here. Number two, students are accustomed to being entertained. The truth of the matter, if you don't like the word entertained, exchange it for the word engaged. They're accustomed to being engaged. And the truth of the matter is, nobody in here wants to be bored to death. Children don't want to be bored to death. And to all the administrators in here, if you have faculty members in, 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 in your school or others in your school who are boring. How many of you know some, some of your people are boring? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, come on, raise your hand. You don't have to call their name. They're not here. Unless they are here, then just don't point. <laughs> Nobody wants to be bored to death. If I had come to you uh, this morning 
and said, you know, good morning to all of you. How are you? Uh, would you please open your booklets to page two? You read silently while I read aloud. <laughs> and we'll do this for the next hour. Thank you to our board of underwriters. Cord, Waco Foundation, Hillcrest. Everybody in here would say, I don't know who that person is that's up there, but I am not going to let him read to me for an hour. Am I right? And you are an adult. So imagine how children feel when a teacher gets up there and says, OK, turn to page 12. OK, and then all the children say, oh, <laughs> we did page 12 yesterday, Ms. Johnson. Then turn to page 13 then. <laughs> Y'all not going to get on my nerve. I had my blood pressure pill. I'm not going to take another one. What we've got to do is recognize that we must deliver what we deliver differently. The third thing that I really want you to kind of buy in on and understand is that as a result, children now have a remote control in their heads. Because when they're sitting at home, they have a remote control in their hands. And they have grown up with this remote control. If, here's, here's, a, here's a fact. If you are dealing with children from the first grade, now in the first grade, the only thing they've ever been experienced, they, they grew up during um, um, iPhone, and so they're, 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 they're accustomed to face screens in the first grade. So now that means from now on, if you don't understand that, you're going to miss the opportunity to, to connect with that student because that student now knows nothing else. How many of you have a Blackberry in your pocket right now? Good, because it doesn't work. Um, <laughs> but do you, how many do you remember when Blackberry was the, was the, the Vogue? I mean, everybody had a Blackberry. Oh, oh, and you should show it off. You're like, hey, you know, I got a Blackberry. Well, now you can't get 25 cent for the Blackberry. So the reality of it is that they're even recognizing in the industry that things are changing rapidly. So in this educational field, we too must change. The fourth one is equally as important, and that is this, and that students are accustomed to receiving information faster than we are accustomed to giving it. And for many of us, we are struggling with that because we learned the old-fashioned way, and we refuse to adjust. We are refuse to make the change. And what we've got to realize is that this change is not just a good idea, it is a necessity if we are going to connect with today's students, if we're going to be effective with today's students. And then the fourth one, uh, fifth one and final one is this, that students are now visual learners. You can't see it, it's okay, I've just given it to you. Students are now visual learners, which says very clearly that there is a different strategy that we must use in teaching visual learners. And if we don't recognize that, we will fail to connect. So what am I trying to get us to see here? I'm trying to get us to buy in on a very simple understanding, and that is, if Waco is to continue its growth, if Waco is to continue its movement in the 21st century, if the things that Charlie and George uh, pointed out to us last night are to really have meaning, we're going to have to make the adjustment in the field of education. Why, you ask? Thank you for asking. The only place where children, the only place where children are mandated to go or to participate in is education. That's the only place. They're not mandated to go to any place of worship. They're not mandated to participate in any organization. They're not mandated to even be in the family that brought them into the world. There's, there's this clause now called emancipation. They are not mandated to stay in anything other than education up to a certain age. 
So the one place where this change that they pointed out to us last night will be acutely felt is in the field of education. And if your numbers are gonna swell of African Americans, if your numbers are gonna swell of Hispanic Latino children, then now is the time, and then even now might be a little late for some, but now is the time that you need to prepare for the change. That's the value of having the Educational Alliance because it brings to you firsthand the latest data. So even if you don't believe what your superintendent is telling you, even if you don't believe what your principal is telling you, then know what that the business community is saying very clearly. There's a change coming here, people. And Waco is going to get swept up in the change. And if we're going to continue to fill that stadium that's right out there, we got to have people in college. No, we don't have to. I guess we could do it to the people around. But then I don't know what the tickets are there. I do know what the tickets are at, uh, in Columbus. And um, they're not what they used to be. How many people have been to a football game lately? You know, uh, prof professional or otherwise. Bottom line is tickets are very expensive now. And, and you can feed a lot of people with uh, what you go to a basketball game or a football game with, and especially if you take the whole family. Well, I, I took mine to see the game the other day at, uh, at uh, O State, and, uh, and, and I looked at the bottom, I didn't realize how much I had paid for those tickets. I, I charged my own family. I, I did, I said, give me, give me half. Give me, I'm not giving you these tickets until I'll pay half, you pay half. And even with that, I was still paying uh, $40, an $80 ticket, you know, times five. That's a lot of money for one game. I was mad the whole game. I don't even know who won. <laughs> I was thinking about how much I had spent on this game. Then it was cold, too, so now I'm really mad. I'm trying to say that if we are to continue our growth, we've got to make the change. Is this making sense? So, know, know, your, know your role in this change. If there's anything I would think that Virginia and others would want you to do, is at the end of this day, or during the lunch, before uh, Mr. Robinson speaks, before Glenn speaks, I need you to say something very clearly. What are we gonna do with this knowledge? What are we going to do at our school? What are we going to do in our organization? What are we going to do at our place of worship? What are we going to do that, to prepare us for the change? Because it's coming, whether you like it or not, it's coming. We used to play a game, uh, I was raised in Birmingham, Alabama. And uh, you know, you like all hid. You know, and, and uh, you know, you say, um, you guys don't know anything about this because you're not from Birmingham. But, but, but it was, you, you, you get on a pole and everybody, and you, and you cover your face so that you can't see everybody run. And you get on the pole and you count. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35, 40. And then you say something stupid like, all hit. Anybody play that game other than me? Okay. And then the reality of it is, you say, at the end of it, ready or not, here I come, ready or not, here comes the change. I hope at the end of this, you can say, I'm ready. We're prepared. We can't wait. Because if you're saying we're still doing it the same old way, know that you, you will quickly get run over. My final point is this. I do not believe that age has anything at all to do with this, this readiness. It's not a question of how old you are and whether or not you can make the change based on your age. Those who are believers know very clearly that um, <laughs> the best work of those who were in the scriptures was done at an older age. 
Oh, you like that, though? You like that one? It's true. The best work was done by those when they reached a certain age. I say to men all the time, you know, my men love to talk about, you know, I, I'm too old now. I'm letting the next generation do it. I, no, you just lazy. That's all. <laughs> There's a difference between you're not waiting on somebody else to do it. You're just lazy. There is no reason for us to wait. In fact, I say to men when I'm, when I'm working with uh, men organizations around the country that <laughs> we can't be used. We can't be trusted until we're old. And you know why. We get easily distracted. But when we old, you can be distracted, but it don't mean nothing. <laughs> it means absolutely nothing. But when you're young, you know, like you go, oh, oh, yeah, oh, over there, over there, over there, okay, over there. Now when you're old, it's like, yeah, I see it. <laughs> Take care of yourself. God bless you. <laughs> but now we're at a stage where we can be used because we are being slowed down based on age and we're just ripe. And for those people who are looking forward to retirement, then you really are not in your ministry. Now I'm not talking about those who are in faith based now, I'm talking about everybody in here. Your ministry, not, 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 don't get that confused with preaching and calling. Your ministry is what you've been placed on this earth to do. Sometimes it's just standing in front of children, letting them see success. Not with some degree of arrogance, but just saying, you know what? This is what education can do for you as well. And I say to the young people as well as my own children, I want you to go farther than I went. And I say to my children, hey, I, I try my best to raise the bar. So, they, you know, so when, if you're going to try to go farther than daddy, you got a lot to do. And they look like, I ain't got a lot to do. I say, yes, you do. First of all, you got to get a job. <laughs> that always works. It, it humbles them all the time. Dad, you always bring up the job thing. You always like, I'm not looking. I didn't see why you talking to me. If you, why, if you were out looking, you wouldn't be here talking to me now. Go look for a job. But what I need our children to see are examples of success, and I think it will make a difference. The future is in the hands of the people who are in here. Touch somebody to your right and say, the future is in your hand. <laughs> I just want to make sure. Some of you, I don't, I'm not sure I want the future in your hand, but for everybody else, I look forward to joining you and making sure that Waco and all of the surrounding areas are ready to receive the change and ready to move our children forward. Thank you for this opportunity. I look forward to working with all of you.